When the creators of The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening were asked in 1993 what they wanted players to check out in their game, the co-writer of the story, Koizumi Yoshiaki, responded simply by saying, The ending. Regarding the ending of Link's Awakening, spoiler alert if you haven't played it, it's been described by some as being possibly the most screwed up ending to any video game ever, darker than Majora's Mask, an experience comparable to having your heart ripped out and thrown down an endless pit. What happens at the end of the game? Well, you kill everyone you've met and destroy a country, only to end up stranded in the middle of the ocean. It's easy to understand why people call this game dark. On the other hand, many players, myself included, find the ending of this game to be hauntingly beautiful. It stayed with me ever since I first played it as a kid. And if the tone of the music that closes the game is any indication, it doesn't feel like the game just wants to leave us with a sense of darkness. It feels like the game has something meaningful and beautiful that it's aching to express. My name is Dan, I've studied game design and theology, and I've written in the past for ZeldaUniverse.net. In this video, I'm going to dive deep into the story of Link's Awakening and its literary context to help you draw from its wisdom while facing today's world. I'll begin by comparing the game to two familiar stories it alludes to and draws inspiration from, to see what themes and ideas stand out through the lenses they offer. After that, I'll turn to the game's Japanese context to identify two trends in Japanese art that have surfaced in this work. I'd love to read your thoughts on my interpretation in the comments, and if you'd like to support this channel, please remember to like the video and subscribe. The music I'm using is from a Link's Awakening album by the second narrator. You can find links to this album and to his Patreon page in the description. So, let's get started. The director of Link's Awakening, Tezuka Takashi, had wanted to do something different with this game. He'd wanted to take a step back from the grand scale of the usual recurring Legend of Zelda storyline, so he gave his writers these instructions. No Triforce, no Princess Zelda, no Hyrule. Instead, he wanted something reminiscent of the hit TV show Twin Peaks, a focus on a small setting with strange characters. Writer Tanabe Kensuke developed these characters, and he also wanted this world to have a giant mountaintop egg at its center. And I wonder whether he had the theme song from the old TV show Monkey caught in his head at some point. That first egg was named Thought. Buddha said, with our thoughts, we make the world. Tanabe had a different idea for what would happen when this egg hatches. In the meantime, the rest of the team was busy putting Mario characters into a Zelda project for laughs. The team wanted help with the story, so they brought on board Koizumi, a recent graduate from Osaka University of the Arts. His co-workers have described him as a romantic sort of person, who would later stamp his worldview on the Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Koizumi had wanted to become a film director, but saw in game development an opportunity to create a kind of drama that you don't find in films. And so the team created a new and original story for the game. A story about the hero Link traveling across the sea on a journey back to his home. Totally original, right? The hero gets caught in a storm. A bolt of lightning destroys his boat, but a young woman finds and rescues him while he's still clinging to life. She welcomes him to her home, Koholint Island, and starts to develop feelings for him. And leaving this island to return home is not going to be easy. Link's Awakening is borrowing quite a bit from the Odyssey, Homer's ancient epic about the hero Odysseus traveling across the sea to return home to Ithaca. Along the way, Zeus chucks a bolt of lightning at Odysseus' boat and destroys it, but a nymph named Calypso finds and rescues Odysseus while he's still clinging to life. She brings him ashore her island, develops feelings for him, and keeps him imprisoned there. No one comes or goes from my island. 
Link is stranded, Odysseus is stranded, but in both stories, help is on the way. In Link's Awakening, an owl shows up to mentor Link throughout his quest, helping him to find the one way to leave the island. In the Odyssey, there's the goddess Athena, a big fan of owls, by the way. She intervenes up on Mount Olympus, sending the messenger Hermes to Calypso with instructions to let Odysseus go. From that point on, Athena disguises herself in several forms while helping Odysseus get back to his home. Surprisingly enough, or not, it turns out that this owl who's been helping Link is actually a sort of god in disguise. The owls are not what they seem. Now let's fast forward to the end of the game. With help from the owl, Link escapes the island, but he ends up in the middle of the ocean, clinging to the wreckage of his ship. And the game just leaves him there. We don't find out if he survives. But then, if we look back at the Odyssey, after Odysseus escapes Calypso's island, he also ends up in the middle of the ocean, clinging to the wreckage of his raft. If Link's Awakening is indeed appealing to our familiarity with the Odyssey, then we could remember that Odysseus has made an art out of the act of clinging to driftwood in the middle of the ocean and somehow surviving. And based on this connection, perhaps we can make a reasonable assumption that Link survives just like Odysseus. And because we can do this work for ourselves, the game has the freedom to end exactly where it wants to end, leaving the focus of this story on the game's retelling of the Calypso episode. That being said, the game does mix together elements from other chapters of the Odyssey as well. Odysseus has countless stories to tell about the mysterious lands and islands he's been to, most of which were home to some hidden trial or temptation that threatened to doom his journey home. Koholand Island has some features in common with these legendary places. It's even rumored to have a dark secret of its own. In the Odyssey, if you go to the land of the Lotus Eaters and taste the lotus fruit, you lose all thoughts of home. And then there's Circe's Island, where a sorceress offers food and drink that turns men into pigs. In Link's Awakening, the islander Terran goes into the mysterious forest and eats a mushroom that turns him into a raccoon and erases his memories. Link needs to go find a local sorceress who can break the spell. Of course, because this is Nintendo, there's also a joke in there about Mario, mushrooms, and the Tanuki suit. And then there's that time in the Odyssey when Odysseus's crew decides to steal from a vengeful god. They get themselves stuck on this island and are starving to death, so they eat the cattle that belongs to the sun god. The meal groans portentously while they cook it. And then the wind changes and they set sail, and Zeus gets word of what happened and he kills them all with a bolt of lightning. Except for Odysseus, who had abstained from the meal. In Link's Awakening, there are some very useful and very expensive items in the local shop, and cutting down this convenient field of grass nearby looking for cash quickly gets old. If Link walks out of the shop with a stolen good, his conscience groans portentously. Are you proud of yourself? And then if he goes back inside, the shopkeeper kills him with lightning. Oh, and once you steal, your name becomes Thief. And there's nothing Odysseus hates more than losing his name and becoming nobody. Koholent Island is a strange and dangerous sort of wonderland, but what we've looked at so far is just set up for the revelation of its true danger. To leave the island, Link needs to find the instruments of the Sirens, and use them to wake up the Windfish, who is sleeping inside this giant egg on top of a mountain. The mythological sirens used to be depicted as birds with human faces, but over time it became popular to represent them as mermaids. Just imagine the Rito tribe evolving into the Zora tribe, instead of the other way around. The sirens sing to lure sailors to their doom, as the Manual for Link's Awakening reminds us. They might draw sailors towards rocks that destroy their boats, or if you make it to their meadow, you might just sit there and listen long enough to join the piles of moldering bodies and withering skins that surround the singers. So what does the Siren Song have to do with the story of Link's awakening? While searching for these instruments, Link finds out that the reason why he needs to wake the Windfish is because the Windfish is the one who is dreaming the island into its existence. Link is caught inside of a dream, 
which begs the question, what happened to his physical body? If he was never rescued from his shipwreck, then Link could very well be drowning during this hallucination episode. Kind of like Terran, Link is caught under a hypnotic sleep spell, and if he can't snap out of it, he's going to die. Koholand Island is playing the role of the Song of the Sirens. A major part of the reason why it's so difficult to break free of this siren song has to do with a certain mesmerizing singer named Marin, the girl who found and rescued Link. Those who hear her sing become totally absorbed in her song. When she sings, Marin usually stands next to the grave of a rooster. Roosters wake us up, the rooster here is not going to cry out and break her spell. Official art tends to depict Marin holding a harp, even though she's never shown with one in-game. But this is an image that's frequently associated with sirens. So it seems like Marin is being portrayed as a siren. It also seems like she's playing the role of Calypso. Which means, judging by the source material, she's probably going to stand in the way of Link's attempt to return home. However, Marin does not do this. She never tries to stop Link from leaving the island, she accepts the fact that he is going to leave. And her song, The Ballad of the Windfish, is a song of awakening. It breaks the spell of the sirens. By teaching Link this song, Marin helps save his life. Marin even tries to wake the windfish herself, which results in her being captured by a group of nightmares. The Nightmares are monsters that are trying to keep the Windfish asleep forever while they take control of the dream world. Maybe the Nightmares are stepping into aspects of the roles that Marin rejected. Like Calypso, they try to persuade Link to stay on the island forever. Like the Sirens, they try to kill Link before he can snap out of the hypnosis. When we look at Link's awakening through the lens of the Odyssey, this is what we see. A story about a hero journeying home who overcomes the siren song temptation to remain within an imaginary, illusory world of fictional escapism. This is a story about leaving Calypso, rather than staying on her island forever. As a retelling of the Odyssey, we could compare Link's Awakening to the 1995 anime short Magnetic Rose and its story of a siren song set in space. Here, the siren character plays her part perfectly, but Marin does not. She is portrayed like a siren, and she's walking in the footsteps of Calypso, but she does not fulfill our expectations for these roles. Instead, by sharing her song, she saves Link's life at the cost of her own existence. Marin may not correspond to a character from the Odyssey, but she is based on a familiar literary character, and the game tells us exactly who that is. On Koholint Island, there's a statue of a mermaid that looks out over the island's bay. In the game, there is a mermaid nearby who had posed as the model for the statue, but she is not exactly the subject of the sculpture. When you're able to go up to the statue late in the game, you can read its title. The Morning Mermaid. Same in the Japanese text. Ningyo Zo. This title directs our attention beyond the game itself. It reminds us of the famous mermaid statue in Copenhagen, home of Hans Christian Andersen, who wrote the short story The Little Mermaid, which was published in 1837. In 1989, just four years before the original release of Link's Awakening, Disney adapted this story into an animated movie and changed the ending. The Disney movie ends with an implied happily ever after, which is not how the original story ended. Now in 1975, while the creators of Link's Awakening were mostly still kids, another animated version of this story had been made, this one by the Japanese studio Toei Animation. 
This movie largely preserves the story's original ending. Its mermaid is named Marina. The Disney movie has become the most well-known version of the mermaid's story, but the statue of the Morning Mermaid asks us to remember how this story ended before Disney rewrote it, because Link's Awakening remembers the moving power of that ending. Let's look at the two side by side. The Hans Christian Andersen story tells of a mermaid princess who longs for the world above the ocean's surface. One day, she goes to the surface and sees a boat caught in a storm. As lightning crashes down, a handsome prince falls into the sea, but the mermaid rescues him while he's still clinging to life. She brings him to the shore and starts to develop feelings for him. But she hides in sea foam as a group of young women approaches, which in hindsight is an ominous moment. When the prince finally awakens, he believes another girl is the one who rescued him. Let's compare that to the beginning of Link's Awakening. When Marin rescues Link from his shipwreck, he opens his eyes and mistakes Marin for Princess Zelda. This is also an ominous moment in hindsight. It hints that Marin is part of a dream, probably formed from Link's memories of Zelda. When the dream ends, Marin will disappear with it. But Link exists outside of the dream. He gets to wake up in the real world. The Little Mermaid faces a similar issue. As a mermaid, she doesn't have a soul. Her grandmother tells her that when humans die, because they have immortal souls, they get to go to heaven. Mermaids just dissolve into sea foam. The mermaid princess is not content with this. She wants to marry the prince, binding herself to his soul so that she can go with him to heaven. Meanwhile, Marin is not content with her life on Koholint Island. She's curious about the world beyond. Taryn tells her there is nothing across the sea, but she confides in Link that she's always believed there has to be something out there. She imagines being a seagull and flying to distant places, and she wonders if the windfish has the power to make dreams come true. So she goes to the windfish, makes a wish, and sings. It's unclear whether she's aware on some level what will happen when the windfish wakes. And the mermaid princess goes to see a witch who can give her legs so she can have a chance at winning the prince's heart and soul. But if she fails at this, she runs the risk of dissolving into sea foam the day he marries someone else. As payment for the deal, because the mermaid is, like a siren, the most beautiful of singers, the witch cuts out her tongue. And with that, the silent princess leaves her home and goes into the world beyond to find herself a soul. It does not go well for her. The prince rejects the mermaid and chooses the other woman, whom he believes is his rescuer. The two get married and go to their wedding bed, leaving the mermaid outside their tent awaiting her death. The witch then offers to undo the deal if the mermaid kills the prince. The mermaid refuses, and when morning comes, she leaps into the ocean and dissolves into foam on the waves. Marin saves Link from drowning in the Windfish's dream by sharing the Song of Awakening with him. With that song, Link abandons the island. Marin vanishes, along with the rest of Koholint. Now there is a little more to both stories. The mermaid hears spirits calling to her from the air. These spirits, daughters of the air, invite the mermaid to join them because of her decision to spare the prince. Unseen, the mermaid smiles down at the prince, kisses his bride's forehead, and ascends into the world above. As a daughter of the air, the mermaid can gain a soul and go to heaven, after doing good deeds for about 300 years. And if the children who hear this story behave themselves, she might be able to get there sooner. And you, the player, can help out Marin as well. If you beat the game without dying, then after the credits roll, Marin appears in the sky like a daughter of the air. Her song echoes, and she fades from view, but a seagull appears in her place and flies away. The windfish seems to have granted her wish, and she soars into the world beyond. When we looked at Link's Awakening through the lens of the Odyssey, Koholint Island appeared to be like the Song of the Sirens, a tempting death trap. But the statue of the Morning Mermaid asks us to look at this game through a different lens. 
The Little Mermaid is an ironic reversal of the story of the Siren Song. Here it is the Siren, the mermaid with a beautiful voice, who is doomed by her longing for a handsome sailor. Same in Link's Awakening, the sailor dooms the Siren. But The Little Mermaid is also a story about a girl without a soul who gains one. As a mermaid, she's supposed to just dissolve into sea foam, but instead she ascends to heaven. Likewise in Link's Awakening, Marin is not real, but she becomes real. She transcends her original state of existence. And I think this sort of thing is foreshadowed earlier in the game. At one point, Link goes into a dream shrine and dreams of finding an ocarina within a strange and unsettling maze. When he wakes up, that ocarina from the dream is still with him. This works because of dream logic. It's a dream within a dream. But I think this also hints at the possibilities present in the game's ending. It hints that something found in the dream might be able to exist beyond it. And I think this sort of concept of something real found in a dream works on a rather meta level as well. We could think of Link's Awakening as being self-aware. It's a game about playing a video game. This island was dreamt up by the game's designers, and the player is a real person who's been drawn into this created world and has fallen under its spell. Even the Siren Song gets a little bit meta, seeing as the Sirens are inviting Odysseus to come and listen to the Iliad. Odysseus wants to abandon his present story so he can listen to that one instead. And if you want to take a break from your present life, you can play Link's Awakening. But there are some wake-up calls that break the illusion. Link's Awakening doesn't really disguise the fact that it's a game, especially not with all the Mario characters running around. Kids break the fourth wall to talk about gameplay concepts they don't understand, and this guy knows that he's going to be lost in the mountains later on. Knowing that the game is imitating Twin Peaks, it's tempting to compare this idea to the interpretation of Twin Peaks that's been discussed by the YouTube channel Twin Perfect. Letting go of this illusion is like ending your time in a video game world and returning to the real one. But when the game is done and the island is gone, did anything from that imaginary world stay with you afterwards? Was there something real in it? something that transcends the game. Link's Awakening started out as a retelling of the Odyssey, the story of a sailor longing for home, but it is also a retelling of the Little Mermaid, the story of a siren longing for the world beyond her home. The game juxtaposes these two contrasting stories, and in the midst of this tension around the concept of home, there's something the game wants us to realize and remember. It's not just this island that's going to disappear. The soundtrack of Link's Awakening makes considerable use of what composer Jason Yu calls the Jaws effect in an essay deconstructing the game's music. The Jaws effect, achieved through a variety of techniques, creates a pervasive sense of looming danger, a sense that something is getting closer, there's something lurking in the water. The original version of Link's Awakening had you uncovering the island map one tile at a time, but at the center of the island's bay, there was this one stubborn tile that remained a secret, even after you'd explored all around it. It's not until you gain the ability to swim halfway through the game that you can finally go there and discover a giant catfish fenced in by boulders. This is an image we've seen before in the previous Zelda game, A Link to the Past, at the Lake of Ill Omen, as Gaijin Goomba has discussed in his Culture Shock YouTube series. Inside the catfish's mouth, there's a dungeon in the shape of an eel, 
And there's also a giant slime eel who warns you that the island is not what it seems. Up till now, this video has been discussing stories and myths that Western audiences are probably familiar with. But we're going to shift gears now and pay more attention to its Japanese context, starting with some mythology about a catfish and an eel. According to one myth, the Japanese archipelago sits atop a giant eel known as Jinshin Yuo. When the eel stirs, it causes earthquakes and tsunamis. Another myth involves the catfish, Namazu. Namazu warns people when an earthquake is about to strike, which is very helpful given that four tectonic plates converge beneath Japan. Today in Japan, you might find Namazu appearing as an earthquake safety mascot, kinda like Smokey the Bear. Eventually, Namazu came to play the same role as Jinshin Yuo. Instead of a giant eel, there was said to be a giant catfish in the watery depths beneath Japan, causing earthquakes. To stop the earthquakes, Namazu is pinned down by a giant stone held in place by the god Kashima, much like the ring of boulders that imprison Koholint's giant catfish. But Kashima is sometimes negligent, and Namazu breaks loose. So when you've got a giant catfish and a giant eel showing up on Koholint Island, there's a good chance there's a disaster that's coming. Right after this dungeon, you go into a shrine and read that the island is like a bubble floating towards a needle. When the windfish wakes up, the world will end. While Link's Awakening does preserve the tragic tone of The Little Mermaid's ending, the game also broadens the scale of the tragedy. Here, it's not just one girl, but an entire island that disappears, foreshadowed by the presence of Namazu. This is an apocalyptic story, part of a larger trend in Japanese art. The scholar Susan Napier, while tracing apocalyptic themes in Japanese anime, has suggested that Japan's history of powerful seismic activity and natural calamity has helped sustain an awareness of the fragility of human civilization. And compounding this, there is the fact that Japan alone has suffered the devastation of the atomic bombs unleashed on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. Takahashi Akahiro, a survivor of the bombing, had been in line for school at the time. He said, I felt the city of Hiroshima had disappeared all of a sudden. According to Susan Napier, although the bomb itself is not always specifically delineated, it stalks through a notable amount of post-war Japanese culture in a variety of displaced versions. In 1954, there was the movie Godzilla, about a giant monster under the sea near Japan, awakened by the United States testing atomic weaponry. The 1973 film Nihon Chinbotsu focuses more on natural calamities. Here, seismic activity causes Japan to sink into the ocean as the camera lingers on the waters where the islands used to be. Link's Awakening has a spare witness to the disappearance of an entire world gone in a flash of light. At the same time, the Mario characters running around remind us that this is an illusion. The apocalyptic stakes are not actually real. But nevertheless, there's something about the experience of playing this game that's more than just illusion. As you stand in front of the mountaintop egg, imagining everything that's about to vanish, here's what's happening. There's a team of artists from Japan sharing with you an awareness of the fragility of the world. The wake-up call is real. The prologue to Link's Awakening from the original Game Boy manual provides some additional context for this story. The kingdom of Hyrule had recently been attacked by the monstrous Ganon, and although Link defeated him, the people of Hyrule have been living in fear ever since. Ganon, after all, has a history of returning time and time again. So Link sets out in search of enlightenment to help him protect his home from the next catastrophe. In 2011, Skyward Sword presented the origin story for this recurring conflict. In that game, Link plays a role similar to Kashima, trying to keep a Godzilla-like monster pinned down beneath a stone despite its perpetual attempts to break loose. And this sets the stage for the recurrence of the Calamity of Ganon. And even though Ganon has already been defeated in Link's Awakening, the fear of Ganon continues to haunt people's nightmares. 
the monster that's imprisoned in the waters beneath Koholint Island is drawn from the same mythological well as the primeval monster that threatens Hyrule, a symbol of chaos waiting to erupt in a matter of time. And when we're aware of the existence of this sea monster, do we live out our lives in a state of fear? Within the fiction and illusion of the dream world, Link finds some enlightenment. The word apocalypse usually refers to something like global destruction, but originally it meant the revelation of something hidden. It actually comes from the same Greek root as the name Calypso, who kept Odysseus hidden from the world outside for seven years. Calypso, the concealer, is not overjoyed to see me. When Odysseus leaves her island, he goes apo Calypsus, away from Calypso, away from concealment. Link's Awakening retells the story about Odysseus going Apocalypsus, and the game is also about the revelation of a hidden truth, a truth that challenges you with a new level of awareness that wakes you up and changes the way you see the world. The fact that the island is a dream is not the only revelation. As mentioned before, there's a group of kids on the island who frequently talk about things they don't understand. Eventually, Link asks them when they began living on the island, and in response they say, what do you mean by when? The two Zelda games that followed Link's Awakening, Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, told the story of the Hero of Time, but I think that Link's already started to become associated with time in this game. He represents the arrival of time in a world where it seemed to not exist. It's kind of fitting that his name becomes Thief. One of his enemies tells him, if it weren't for you, nothing would have to change. The Neverland Dream of Link's Awakening, the Rip Van Winkle story of Ocarina of Time, and the Groundhog Day premise of Majora's Mask all bear some resemblance to the 1984 film Rusei Yatsura 2, Beautiful Dreamer, which opens with the image of a broken clock tower looming over a post-apocalyptic landscape. In this movie, there's a girl who's happy with her life the way that it is, and wants to escape from the possibility of it changing. Link's Awakening is about the revelation of the meaning of the word when. After all, it is based on the story of Calypso's island, and it was there that Calypso offered Odysseus immortality. But instead, he left. I remember the first time I reached the ending of Link's Awakening and watched the island disappear. What a haunting feeling that was. It was hard to describe. Like most Zelda games, Link's Awakening was made in Kyoto, Japan, which is also the place that gave us what's often considered the world's earliest novel, The Tale of Genji, written by Lady Murasaki in the 11th century. In the 18th century, the scholar Motori Norinaga argued that the tale of Genji was written to awaken in readers a sense of this thing called Mono no Oware. This interpretation became hugely influential, and since then Mono no Oware has been called the wellspring of Japanese aesthetics. Norinaga's analysis is not the only conversation to be had regarding the tale of Genji, but it did leave its mark on Japanese art history. And for me, I think that Link's Awakening, a product of Japanese art, did something similar to what Norinaga said the tale of Genji is supposed to do. It gave me a sense of Mono no Oware. So what is Mono no Oware? The concept is rooted in Shintoism, Japan's native religion, which emphasizes practicing a sensitivity to nature. It's also been influenced by Buddhism, which emphasizes that the world is in a continual state of change. To feel mono no oware is to feel moved by things that are impermanent. You could think of it as a cultivated sensitivity to the unavoidable transience of the world. I'm going to give you three classic images as examples. First, there is the popularity of cherry blossoms in Japan. These flowers bloom dramatically for just a few days before the wind takes them, and they fall like snow and are gone. 
People flock to see these blossoms, to picnic beneath them, before all this beauty disappears. But the very fact that they disappear so quickly gives their beauty a haunting quality that moves the heart. During your adventures in the dream world, Marin at one point joins you on a journey across the island. It's one of my favorite parts of the game. There are tons of small moments and interactions between Link and Marin that you can discover during this time. And the Nintendo Switch remake even changes the instrumentation of multiple background music tracks to emphasize the charm and poignancy of this brief shared journey. You'll miss out on so much if you just rush to your destination. But eventually, you come to the sleeping walrus who'd been blocking your path. Marin sings her song to wake up the big sleeping sea mammal, and then a group of animals call out to her, wanting her to sing for them. She says, it's the same as always, and walks away to join them. It's right here that the tone of the game begins to shift. Up till now, it's been incredibly cute, whimsical, and charming. But now, an increasing sense of melancholy starts to set in. In place of Marin, there will soon be a sad ghost following you around. You'll meet the catfish and the eel, and learn the island's secret. That moment when Marin walks away, it feels like the cherry blossoms have begun to fall, until finally, everything that was beautiful is gone. Right after you and Marin part ways, you find an owl statue that compares the end of a dream to foam on the water that disappears. Years later, it caught my attention when the same sort of language appeared in Breath of the Wild. The Carpenter Bolson tells you that he's going to retire, and he urges you to think about how you're spending your time. He says, youth, it's just foam on a wave, gone before you know it. This poetic image is not something the Zelda games came up with. Again, going back a thousand years to Japan's medieval Heian period, an early anthology of waka poetry known as the Kokin Shu lists in its Japanese preface some of the reasons why poets felt moved to write poems. For instance, they may have been startled into thoughts on the brevity of life by seeing the dew on the grass or the foam on the water. But the poets and writers of Japan's Heian period were also influenced by Buddhism and its emphasis on impermanence. For instance, verse 46 of the Dhammapada compares a person's body to mere foam, like the foam on a wave. And then there's also the Diamond Sutra, which closes with an invitation to regard our existence in this world like a bubble floating in a stream. So the poetic musings about foam that we find in Zelda are as traditional as it gets. To quote the carpenter once more. One other image that evokes thoughts of impermanence would be the cicada. If you're in Japan in the summer, you are bound to hear cicadas singing. But after emerging from the ground and casting off their shells, they live and sing for only a matter of weeks. When summer ends, their singing dies out, but the shells remain. Cicada shells often evoke memories of summer and thoughts of impermanence. Studio Ghibli, for instance, uses the symbolism of cicadas in their 2014 retelling of the tale of the bamboo cutter. This symbolism is reinforced by the titles you'll find on the movie's soundtrack. Using this symbolism, the movie references a well-known chapter from the beginning of the tale of Genji. In that chapter, Genji is creeping up on a lady who runs away from him, leaving behind her robe. Genji keeps the robe as a memento of her, and compares it to a cicada shell cast off by someone who disappeared. And to go back to Toei's adaptation of The Little Mermaid, while this movie is largely faithful to the story's original ending, one thing that changes in this version is that the mermaid leaves behind a scale as a memento for the prince, like a cast-off shell. When Link wakes up and Marin has vanished, her song still remains lodged in Link's heart. This song is a memento she left behind, like the shell left by a cicada that disappeared at summer's end. With these three images of impermanence, we can summarize what the windfish says to Link at the end of the game. Like a blossoming flower, the dream world was beautiful and bursting with life. But like foam on the water, it was never meant to last very long. And upon awakening, all that remains of the dream will be the memory it left behind, like the shells of cicadas at summer's end. The Windfish is describing the meaning of when, 
things disappear and leave behind memories that transcend time, while eggs hatch open and new things come into being. At the same time, within this story we encounter a desire for a greater transcendence, a desire to go beyond the shell of this world. We find Marin gazing out at the ocean, wondering, is this island all there is? The philosopher Watsuji Tetsuro describes Mono no Oware like a sort of mystical experience that stirs within us a yearning for the source of eternity while we pass through things that pass away. And I think Mono no Oware also moves us to feel gratitude for things while they exist. Either way, like a rooster's call, it can keep us from sleeping through life. Mono no Oware means the Aware of things, the moving power of things. Similar to empathy, it's when your own feelings match what you are observing in the world. And because the world is always changing, Aware is often associated with a sense of sorrow and melancholy. In this sense, the opposite of Mono no Oware would be things that are okashi, lighthearted, whimsical, and charming. We could say that the okashi aesthetics of Link's Awakening balance the heaviness of its Mono no Oware. However, Motori Norinaga would argue that Oware has a much broader meaning. According to him, Oware was originally an exclamation, something you would say when you felt deeply moved, like an uttered trace of the heart's outburst. Those feelings could be joy, sorrow, amusement, longing, love. But the opposite would be to feel nothing, at a time when you should feel something. Marin is characterized as someone who feels the aware of things. On a beautiful day, she can't help going outside and bursting into song, whereas Taryn repeatedly sleeps through it. And Marin wants to share her feelings of aware. When she teaches Link her song, she wants to know whether he feels moved by it, and she wants to share that song far and wide. I wonder if she realizes that by sharing her song, she helps save Link's life, which is hanging by a thread. Link has been wandering through a deadly maze filled with nightmares, and by sharing her song, Marin helps him find the way out. And to return to Greek mythology for just a moment, Link is not the only Odysseus in this game. Link meets a wandering ghost and guides this ghost back to its home. There, the ghost is overwhelmed by feelings of nostalgia, but afterwards finds a sense of peace, having shared those feelings with someone else who understood. After all, Link is also a wandering, disembodied spirit longing for home. Before Norinaga wrote his commentary on the tale of Genji, much of the conversation surrounding the book was preoccupied with the question of what moral lessons it contained. Norinaga felt that was missing the point. He argued that the author, Murasaki Shikibu, knew Mono no Oware very deeply in her heart, and could no longer conceal the things she felt. She expressed that Mono no Oware through her story, and gave vent to her own pent-up heart. For Norinaga, songs, poems, and literature all spring from unbearable feelings of aware that cannot be contained, and we find comfort when someone else has heard our song, poem, or story and feels moved by the aware embedded in it. This sort of sharing can give us relief when we recognize that someone else truly understands what we feel. With that in mind, let's take one more look at the story of the Morning Mermaid. The mermaid becomes a spirit of the air, and if you behave yourself, she gets to go to heaven sooner. But if you misbehave, she'll remain in this purgatorial state much longer. It's very manipulative, it probably made the publisher happy, and if you think the significance of this story is that it teaches kids to behave, you might be missing something important. Hans Christian Andersen had been in love with a man named Edvard Collin. In 1835, he wrote in a letter to Colin, If you looked down to the bottom of my soul, you would understand fully the source of my longing and pity me. Even the open, transparent lake has its unknown depths which no divers know. This language is reminiscent of the opening lines of The Little Mermaid, published the year after Colin married Henrietta Tubier in 1836. Today, the three of them are buried together in one plot. 
Colin wrote in his memoir that he found himself unable to respond to Anderson's love, and this caused the author much suffering. With her tongue cut out, the mermaid struggles to communicate what she's feeling. But through her story, the author was able to express what was in his heart. When Koizumi says he wants us to experience the ending of Link's Awakening, I think he wants us to feel moved by its expression of Aware, and its revelation of the meaning of when. And when Link finally wakes up the big slumbering sea mammal, the dream ends with a crash of water, and Link is left alone at sea, until he looks up overwhelmed with joy upon seeing the windfish, the author of the dream, who shared that created world with someone who was deeply moved by it. And as for Marin, she's gone away with the animals. It's the same as always. Unchanged.